us, Syria, you know that Syria, they, uh, they just finished now 10 years, 10 years of uh, civil war. And these 10 years of civil war started because of climate change. There were three years of drought plus the Turks put some dams on the water. There was a shortage of water. And when you have shortage of water, then farmers cannot continue cultivate their land. Then they move to the cities. They move to the cities. There are no jobs. They are unemployed. They start crime. This is how it all started. This is exactly the opposite of cohesion. And here there are estimates or projections that in, in the year 2030, there will be civil war, maybe civil wars in Africa because of climate change. Now in Israel, you should know, I don't know if you know, that we already reuse, reuse 90% of our water. You flush the water in the toilet and the water goes to agriculture. 90% of the water, can you imagine? We are number one in the world here. Here it's written 87%, but in fact it's 90%. Second one is Spain with 17. Here, Europe, 5%. But if we do it in Israel, we can do it also in Kenya. For 90% of the water. And this is how we water our agriculture. And, 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 and. in fact, in some of the places you can you can water only with a reuse water, for example, cotton. Here, this is the dripping system. So not only, but all not only that we reuse water, we also give the plants exactly the amount they need. It's in the desert. Can you imagine? This is this is in the desert. You look at this. This is a uh, cherry tomatoes in the desert and grapes. Lemon, lemon with no seeds. Everything is in the desert. By the way, the governor of uh, Turkana, uh, Nanok, is also alumni. He came and he saw it. Then I will tell, tell, tell you about it. Here, orange is in the desert. If we do it here, we can do it in Masapet. And look at the desert, desert, no soil. But when you bring water, when you reuse water, then there is no problem. And this is in March, 2020, last year, we had the group from Kenya that came to Galilee. This was together with the World Bank. And the topic was water management, but they did not finish. In the middle, March, 2020, when it all started with COVID, we had to send the group back and I hope that they will come back later this year probably in November or December, and to complete the course. And here we signed an agreement with the Council of Governors, especially in, to reuse water. Here, Turkana, I mentioned Governor Nanok. So we selected, by the way, the size of Nanok, this is the biggest county in Kenya, four times bigger than Israel, close to 80 or 70, 80,000 square kilometers. Israel is only 20,000. So they selected 10 experts on water, engineers, they came to Galilee and they studied uh, for one year uh, water management and we we uh, prepared with them a plan to go back to implement in uh, into Kana. In the meantime, the COVID and I hope that we will resume this cooperation. Here also in Zimbabwe, uh, 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 this is uh, this is uh, Professor Mbebe, the Vice Chancellor of the Midland State University, this is our institute, and and so we designed with them, you know, Zimbabwe, the border in Namibia, and the, the desert of Namibia is moving into Zimbabwe. So we designed water management, how to stop, how to stop the desert into uh, Zimbabwe. And it's a nine month program, postgraduate diploma, and six weeks out of the nine months in Israel. Also, just to give you an example, this is the Turkana in Nigeria, the biggest county in the north, in the Sahara, Kano State, we signed an agreement here, Kano State government, Nigeria, with Galilee International on water management, the same with India, this is a big desert, and we work together. Now one word about agriculture, look at this, this is, uh, I will move fast now. You know, only 2.5% of our GDP is agriculture and the only 3.7% of the workforce. But we produce everything because we reuse water. Look at dairy, dairy industry. You know, can you imagine in Israel, Israeli cow is giving 50 liters of milk per day, 50, five, zero. And there are cows with 70. And uh, we hear why genetics of both, but mainly management and management includes also the nutrition. So in Nieri County, uh, we established
published together with uh, Mao Ama, uh, what is name? I forgot his name, the youngest school. And he and people come from all the county to learn how to, and they multiply. They multiply the amount of milk in one year. One year, they were doing six, seven liters a day. A day and after one year, they did uh, uh, 14, 15 uh, uh, liters a day. So I want to show you, it is possible. Everything is possible. And when the farmers, listen, when the farmer understand that last year, he was uh, making only six, seven liters. And this year, that he is making already 14, 15. Think, just think about his feeling, about his satisfaction, about his cohesion, about the quality. And all the farmers in the Erie County, we also did with Chuka. Here, this is the vice chancellor of Chuka University. He also studied in, in Galilee. We signed an agreement and he established a, a, a dairy farm. He sent four faculty members to Galilee. We trained them for one month. They went back, they established the farm. Not only that he's teaching all the farmers, but he's also selling the milk. Also the university is making money. Here I even flew, they, they sent a, a chopper for me and I, they took me to Samburu to see the cows in Samburu. But the cow in Samburu unfortunately was doing one or two liters a day, unbelievable. Where a cow is a cow, you think there is a difference between cows, cow is a cow. If you if you manage it well, the same cow in Samburu can reach also 40 uh, liters. Now here, pandas, I saw so, so many pandas along in Malindi and all those places. Can you imagine they are making, they are producing 38 pounds a year. In Israel it's 400 pounds, 400 compared to more than 10 times. The same tree, the same tree, what can be the difference? Post harvest, unfortunately here we know that probably 50% of the production, agricultural production, never reaches the market. And here they are talking about 1.3 billion tons per year. Unbelievable. It, I mean, around the world. Here, even the FAO, the Food and Agriculture of the United Nations, says that one third of the production never reaches. Now, think about the, uh, the frustration of the farmer that is working the whole year and with all those floods and uh, things like that. And finally, half of the production never reaches the market. So also in here, 50%, we said 50%, and in Israel we found all kind of things. We can share the experience. It's called long shelf life. Here, this is cherry tomatoes and all others, even mango and all others. One word about research and development, since we are talking about University Karatina, so Israel is number one in the world in, in research and development. 4.5% of our economy is going, is going to research and development. More than all, all the others. Now I want to move fast. Look at this. Most of the research and development is done, not in the universities or the government, by the private sector. The private sector understand that once, once, they, they, you, the company is making money, you don't take all the money, all the profit into your pocket. You invest back in the, uh, uh, in, in the product. And because we invest so much in research, look at the 12 Nobel Prize in Israel, chemistry, 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 economy, and so forth. And we, they say today, startup nation. Here, look at this, all those companies, international companies, IBM, Oracle, they have research centers in Israel. Did you know that the cell phone was developed here in Israel with, together with Motorola? Microsoft in Israel, they have research center here in Herzliya near Tel Aviv. In your, in your computers, you have NTXP, they were all developed here in Israel. Can you imagine NASDAQ? This is the, the, the stock exchange in the United Kingdom, in, in the US, in New York. So look at this. This is the, you know, the only high tech companies are in NASDAQ. 63 companies are listed in the NASDAQ compared to here, look, Japan only six, five, UK, India three, China zero, the only copy. Huh. Intel, can you imagine? In Intel is now the private, the biggest private company in Israel. 40% of the world research of Intel, 8,000 employees is done in Israel. 
and here they invested uh, uh, one billion dollars in Israel. Apple, they never had any uh, research center outside the US, now they open one here in Haifa, near where us. So Israel, most of the export of Israel is high tech now. It, agriculture, also agriculture is becoming high tech. Even space, space, what I wanted to show you, space. Here, Israel is one of the eight nations with space, but look at this, this is a, an Israeli, inco, a, 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 we send this to orbit. This is not what I wanted to show you. This is a regular satellite, but look at this. This is a satellite that was developed in high school by high school students. This is a real satellite. They launch it to orbit. Really, uh, one more thing is in health is that because of research and development, here is a missile engineer that developed a device, health device, with a, you see, he, they developed a missile with a camera at the tip of the missile. So when you shoot the missile, the camera takes pictures, broadcast to the base. Then the same idea, just have to use your imagination. A small medical pill with a small camera and you swallow the pill and the camera takes pictures, the same idea with the missile. And then broadcast here, look at this. This is the pill with the small camera inside the stomach. And this is the picture. So if you have a problem into your stomach, you don't have to open anymore. You take the pill, you take pictures, and the pictures broadcast what is the problem. Not to mention alternative, I'll go fast. Here, alternative, look at this, on the sea. You can put the same thing in Mombasa, on the ocean. This is solar panel. And look at this, now they put in the desert, in the desert, look at this. They hear thousands of mirrors, you see? Thousands of mirrors that, that rotate with the sun. They broadcast the energy to the tower. You see the tower with thousands of degrees and they produce enough electricity for a city of 120,000 people. Can you imagine enough electricity for everything in this town? I wanted to mention national security because this is a former Galilee Institute and myself, we are part of a network of East Africa, which is Tanzania, Kenya, Uganda, Burundi, Rwanda, Ethiopia, and South Sudan. And we meet every year. Of course, now we don't meet because of COVID. This was the member. He is a general coach. He was the chief of staff of uh, Kenya. He passed away recently, unfortunately. He was a very dear friend. He never studied in Israel, but he visited us in Israel. Here we met in Karen. We are talking about peace. And that's what I told you, that uh, we initiated the peace agreement between Ethiopia and uh, Eritrea because, because the minister of a, a defense of Eritrea, Ephraim Sebhat, is alumni of Galilee. And also the, then the minister of defense of Ethiopia was also alumni of Galilee. So this is how we came uh, this idea. I met, this is a professor of Bitti, the former vice chancellor of the uh, University of Kenya, of Nairobi in Kenya. He's also alumni twice. He came twice to Galilee. And, uh, and I proposed to him that uh, we can uh, uh, maybe develop a peace plan to the Shabab. We can propose to the Shabab our knowledge. Maybe the government of uh, Kenya will allocate piece of land in the Northeast there along the coast or somewhere, piece of land. They should lay down their weapon. And uh, we, we, we are willing to contribute our know-how to develop the most advanced agriculture as a model, as a range, as a, uh, we, and uh, here we meet again. And, uh, this is uh, the president of Ethiopia who came to study after he resigned. And then he asked, he asked me, and I came to Ethiopia. I presented, this is the former prime minister of Ethiopia, presented by peace plan. And uh, here, the same thing in Nigeria. We worked in the south of Nigeria. He is the chief of all, all the security uh, forces in Nigeria. So we, uh, together with Amnesty, in the south, in the north you have Boko Haram, but in the south of Nigeria you also had a lot of uh, militants. So the government gave them piece of land. We contributed the know-how, Israeli know-how and agriculture, and you don't hear of any more crime and any more terror there, together with the military intelligence, of course. 
Here, this is the vice chancellor of KCA in uh, Nairobi, that he is also an alumni of Galilee on national security. I want to show you that not only in Africa, but here, this is the prime minister of Punjab that signed an agreement with us on agriculture, agricultural development. They are sending, after the COVID, they will start sending uh, trainers that will train uh, others here, Punjab, the first delegation already came to Galilee. And we also teach in the south of India, look at this. They established a new faculty of agriculture, so they invited Galilee, and we inaugurated here, we inaugurated the faculty, and uh, since then we cooperate, they signed, they sent to us their professors every, every year, I think four professors that come. Also, can you imagine the government of China, big China, that is contributing so much to Kenya, but when they want to study, they come to us and we sign an agreement, five-year agreement on innovation. On uh, uh, This is the third agreement. Every five years we sign an agreement. This is already the third time that we sign an agreement on innovation in agriculture. They come to learn from the Israeli experience. And also on the other side of the globe, Organization of American States, all the 34 countries in Latin America and the Caribbean and the North America, we also work with them. We already signed the third agreement and they come to learn. So the main objective is to receive cohesion, but cohesion, cohesion is just a, 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 a word. How do we get it? How do we get it? So the main thing is to prevent immigration from the agricultural uh, regions to the cities. And look at this. This is how Nairobi looks nowadays, very bad. And uh, in order to minimize immigration, we have to develop efficient agriculture. This is it, this is it, and water. Because the farmers, they prefer to stay where they are. They don't want to be immigrants and they don't want to be refugees in cities and to be unemployed and they, then uh, to end up in prison. So we have this, we, we have a program how to double agricultural production of let's say a county. And I think uh, Mr. Kimemia, uh, also a governor, Niardawa, uh, he's also a alumni of Ghanimi. So already we gave him, but I never heard of me, maybe he's busy in uh, other things, that we can, through training, double the agricultural production in three years. Can you imagine the farmers will be happy the farmers will, that's it, they will make some money. So this is in three years. How do we do it? We bring trainers, the training, trainers afterwards go and we want to reach every farmer in the county, every farmer. And we also send our experts. And uh, 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 here we are talking about eight disciplines like agribusiness, dairy, horticulture, poultry, fishery post-harvest to reduce the loss, fruit, water, and irrigation, of course. Here, this is crop, poultry, the aquaculture, so important. And the, of course, dairy, I showed you the dairy, post-harvest to reduce the 50%. And the agribusiness, how to compete in the world, in, agri in, 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 uh, in the world, is, you have so many competitors, and uh, here, foods and flowing culture, uh, look at this. Uh, Flowers, look at this. This is in 2000, just as an example, for Valentine's Day in 2017, Israel sent to Europe, just to Europe, 60 million flowers, just for one day. Kenya can do, can do better. And of course, uh, here, national, look at this. This is the, if we want to increase agricultural production, mainly through uh, know-how, not through allocating more. Uh, land. So only 9% from increased land, you know, by 2030. And by 2030, remember, by 2030 or 20, I think 2050, you're going to be 80 million people. You must double agriculture. You have to feed everybody. You're talking about cohesion. Cohesion comes after the, the, the stomach is full. So here we have this digital agriculture. Uh, we have a program, I'd say, Postgraduate diploma on, on uh, uh, digital agriculture. We have post uh, uh, postgraduate diploma also on digital health. So really, in Kenya and Israel, we are such good friends, and I come to Kenya quite often. And uh, here we have we have to invest in education. Please forward this message to your minister, to George 
our alumni was my student. So here, I hope I convince you what can we do together. Then first of all, it is possible. You understand that it is possible. And we can double the production on a national or maybe county level. As I said, of course, reuse of water is so important. And water management, we have to prepare also to disaster to not to be a, a surprise. Solar energy, of course, solar energy. You have the solar and the same solar. And we have this Zoom training and the post graduate diploma. They asked me to, uh, to talk 40 minutes. This is exactly 40 minutes. I want to thank you all. And uh, if you have any questions, you can uh, send me a, a chat or just send by uh, email to Galilee Institute and I will reply. I want to thank you very much. I cannot stay. Maybe if, uh, if there are any questions now, Please unmute yourself. I don't hear anything. Oh, Thank yeah. You. Thank you, Professor. Yes. Thank you, Please. Professor. Yes, I hear you. I hear you. Yes. yes. Uh, let me talk from the other mic. Thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, uh, Chevelle, uh, thank you for that very stimulating uh, presentation. Uh, indeed, uh, you have demonstrated how uh, economic development or economic empowerment can promote cohesion and uh, integration. You have actually shown how education, and you have illustrated it using your institution how uh, uh, economic, how education can bring about uh, uh, cohesion and integra integration. You have also shown how technology can also bring about uh, cohesion and integration and even stop uh, civil wars or minimize civil wars. And you have also shown how uh, agricultural productivity can uh, reduce the migration to urban areas and uh, that promotes uh, cohesion and integration. Yes, uh, we will have some questions for you and we will take, uh, uh, we'll start by taking three questions. Uh, if there is, uh, Dr. Mengo, if there are questions on the chat. As, as we wait, okay, uh, we will take questions from the floor, but let's, let's start with this one first. Professor, uh, we would want, want to know what is the major factor that has contributed or that is behind Israel's uh, cohesiveness. Israel is a very cohesive nation. What are the key factors that has contributed to this? Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Professor. John Mwaruvie, uh, thank you very much, Prof, for your stimulating um, presentation on how, on how economic emp uh, empowerment can uh, promote uh, cohesiveness and integration. Uh, my question is, yes, can you hear us now, Prof? Can you hear the question? Hear the question? Are you hearing me? Are you able to hear me? Hello? Are you hearing me, Prof?
Hello. Uh, uh, Prof. Uh, he's logged out. He's not in the meeting. He was not able to hear us. So we will proceed to the next. We will take the questions towards the end of this session, after your session. We we'll take all of them together. So, so at this juncture, uh, we want to present the next presenter, and the, the next presenter is our dear friend, uh, and uh, I can uh, we continue to say for him at some at some level. So we want to ask all uh, other people who are uh, with us online to mute, so that only the speaker uh, uh, is speaking. Is unmuted. Yes, and uh, with that I want to take this opportunity uh, to release to us our second speaker, and our second speaker is Professor. Professor Piero Mumba. Piero Mumba. Piero Mumba. Yeah. I was okay. Can I go ahead? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, everybody, for being patient. Uh, uh, we are going on well. We'll get our first speaker online after the end of the second session. And in the second session, we are inviting our dear friend, uh, Professor Piero uh, Lumumba. Professor Lumumba. Uh, is our friend and a friend of Karatina University. Uh, and Professor Rumumba has uh, done so much, achieved so much within his uh, life. Uh, and we cannot uh, be able to say all of them now, but I'll mention a few. Of course, you know him. He's a very eloquent speaker. And uh, of course, you also know uh, that he has a PhD uh, in law in uh, yes phd in laws and uh, in that matter uh, public law in case i make a mistake uh, we got this information uh, online in case uh, we we uh, we we are incorrect uh, prof you will correct us as you take uh, over uh, yes um, professor rumumba has a phd uh, from the university, uh, from uh, Gent University, Belgium. Uh, he's also um, a holder of an honorary degree uh, from the Cape Coast uh, uh, in, in Ghana. He is an expert uh, in public law, and uh, he's also a former director of the, the uh, 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 school, um, uh, Kenya School of Law, he is also a former uh, director of the Kenya Anti-Corruption Commission, 
and we know the work he did, and we know how he wrestled with the uh, giant of um, um, uh, uh, corruption. Uh, yes, he is also a founder of uh, the School of Law in Kambarak. He's the founder dean. Uh, he's also a former secretary of the Commission uh, uh, for uh, Constitutional Commission of Kenya. Uh, he's also a, a fellow uh, of the Institute of Certified Public Sec Secretaries of Kenya. Uh, he's also a certified mediator. He has trained in humanitarian law uh, in Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, he has uh, written, of course, several books. You have interacted with them and articles. Uh, he has also been awarded uh, early in his uh, early years. He was awarded uh, the Distinguished Leadership Award um, uh, uh, by the African Institute of um, by the African International University for providing exemplary servant leadership. Um, and uh, last year, not least, uh, he was also recognized by the America, uh, um, by, by the Kenya America Association of um, uh, uh, Martin Luther King for his uh, leadership and uh, in that leadership award. These are just among others, and uh, Professor Piero Rumumba uh, will be speaking to us today. Uh, if you are online, I encourage you to post your question in the chat. If you are here, you can still post it in the chat, and you can also ask it. We will take the questions to answer once the end of uh, this session. Professor Mumba, you have uh, 40 minutes to talk to us. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, let me congratulate the university for organizing this conference. Uh, cohesion is very important. I've just heard my friend from Israel speak, and I will be asking him the question, because what he was saying completely is contradicted by what is on the ground. Israel has just been fighting a war. Uh, it's a mono-ethnic and there is no cohesion in Israel. <laughs> so when he says that agriculture and other things create cohesion, I'm really, I think anybody listening to him would wonder whether he's talking about the same Israel that is at war and in an easy ceasefire with the Palestinians and has fought over six wars because of lack of cohesion. It's very important that when we are talking about this, we are not... Uh, too polite in asking our questions because when we are too polite then we hide the reality and I preface that because I was supposed to speak yesterday when my very good friend the chair of the national cohesion was here and he heads the national cohesion in Kenya and my subject is about unity in diversity. In order to talk about the subject of unity in diversity, particularly in Kenya, it is important to read the book written by Koigi Wawamwere. Koigi Wawamwere has written a very important book towards genocide in Kenya, the curse of negative ethnicity. And that book is important to the extent that it warns Kenya. And remember, Kenya is only 58 years old. The country that we call Kenya, constituted as it is, is 58 years old, having come into being in 1963. And it is a state that has different nations. And these nations were put together in 1884 at the Berlin Conference. Kenya, like many African states, is therefore an artificial entity ever struggling to be a united 
country. And this is not unique to Kenya. Let me just give you a geographical survey of what is happening in Africa today. In order to understand that cohesion is not easy. As I talk to you now, there is war in northern Mozambique. As I speak to you now, there is an ease in Somalia. As I speak to you now, there is war in Ethiopia. The Tigre have risen up. The Oromo have risen up. The Somalis in Ogaden have risen up. As I speak to you now, there is war in Sudan, in the Nuba Mountains, in Bar el Ghazal, in Darfur. As I speak to you now, there is an ease in South Sudan. It's only about two weeks ago that they put together a government of 550 members of parliament with five vice presidents because they believe that that is what is going to bring about cohesion. As I speak to you, there is war in Eastern Congo, which is ethnically driven. Last night only there were grenade attacks in Bujumbura, in Burundi, in the entire Sahelian region, in Mali. Two days ago there was a coup d'etat in Mauritania, in Chad, in Burkina Faso, in Cameroon. That is Africa for you. So when we talk about cohesion, we ought to be very careful. In this country, we have had clashes. In 1992, they were referred to as political clashes. In 1997, we had similar clashes. In the year 2007, we had clashes. And indeed, it is through the effort of the international community that Kenya did not degenerate into civil war. And when indeed Kofi Annan and Grasa Marshall were here, they said that there are four things that Kenya ought to have done. One, of course, was to immediately ensure that there was ceasefire at that time. We lost over 1,500 people there, and there are people who are still displaced. We then said that we needed a new constitution and we had the constitution of Kenya 2010 under President Kibaki, but it had started a little earlier and I was very intimately involved in it in the year 2001. Then we said that we would deal with the question of land, truth, justice and reconciliation, which have never been implemented. You remember that both the current president of the Republic of Kenya and the deputy president were indicted in the International Criminal Court. That is how close this country has come to breaking apart. In the year 2017, you will remember there was a dispute about the elections, and you will remember that at that time, there was a threat, complete with maps, to divide Kenya into two so that some individuals from the western part could control that part and President Kenyatta and others would control. This is how serious the question of cohesion has been in this country. And my fear sometimes is that we don't take it very seriously as a country, particularly the political class. And this is what Koigi talks about in his book. That as a country, we are engaged in pretense. But that pretense threatens the very being of the country. The creation of the Commission of National Cohesion is in itself indicative of the fact that we are a thoroughly divided society. And you only have to listen to the political leaders. In fact, it's wrong to call them leaders. They are misleaders. They don't lead anybody anywhere. They just misguide the nation. You've got to listen to them. Don't listen to them 
when they are in podia such as this listen to them at funerals when they are speaking their mother tongue listen to them when they are in their local vernacular radio stations what they say listen to them even in matters that ought to be national recently we had the interviews for those who are to be appointed as the chief justice of the republic of kenya and a member of the supreme court and the entire enterprise was an ethnic enterprise complete with the chair of the judicial service commission asking every candidate where do you come from in other words she was trying to determine their ethnicity and yet we are looking for the chief justice of the republic of kenya when as a lawyer i appear before a judge do i care whether the judge is kamba kikuyu man or woman i simply want an individual who has read the law and will determine the case on the basis of the law and the facts but we ask one of the candidates who was then appointed as a member of the supreme court told the very assembly on that day of the interview kenya is terribly tribal even this tribe you know is tribal that is the nation that we are talking about there is the nation where even in the creation of universities including this one is informed by ethnicity and even when you want to choose a vice chancellor here the people here will want somebody from here and when that somebody is not from here they grumble i want you to look at the universities across the country the public universities all of them almost all of them if you don't get a vice chancellor from that area the people the politicians say this is our university can you believe it that is the country that we are talking about and i can give examples of in in the university of elderate masinde muliro university where vice chancellors have been threatened because they did not come from that area in kisi university that is what we are talking about when you hire kenyans you are told they do not come from that area yet you have the thing called national cohesion and integration and is not only in the education sector it is in every sector in health sector in the security sector in appointment of government officials everything in this country has degenerated into ethnicity koigo amwere says because the political misleaders have convinced their people and hypnotized them like the python does that our being and survival demands that the other ethnicities are not taken care of so that it is in this conflict that they thrive recently i'm going to give examples my good friend jb muturi who is the speaker of the national assembly of kenya is anointed as a leader of mount kenya in the 21st century in the 21st century the speaker of the national assembly is so anointed and we are not angry at it chairman of the national cohesion does not complain about it now president kenyatta will be traveling to rural to nyanza and the culmination of the celebration of 58 years will be in nyanza in kisumu it is being pre presented as a luo affair It is a law and not a national affair. 
yet Nyanza has the couriers, has kisses, has maragolis, has subas, has all these ethnicity, yet a national event is being project, projected as a law affair. You only have to read the social media to see what is happening. Because that is the reality. And yet when we come to podia such as this, we pretend. And as long as we pretend we apply band aid solutions to what is a cancerous problem. You know, a year ago, a young man who is my mentee, a young man who is a doctor, was employed at the head of the medical service in Siaya County, which is my aboriginal county apart from Nairobi. He was hounded out of office, a doctor, on the ground that he is a Luo but from Migori. As I speak now, he is the head of the medical service in Migori, having been hounded out of Shire because he is a Luo, but from Migori. That is how low we have descended as a country. And I dare tell you that if even today, here in Nyeri, you are appointed the head of the medical services from Kiambu. The people of Nyeri will complain and vice versa. If you went to Chuka University and appointed a law on merit as the vice chancellor, the aborigines of that area will complain. That is your nation. That is the Kenya that I'm talking about. And I'm suggesting to us that unless we change, there will be an hour of reckoning. Because our cup of iniquity is getting full by the day. We have political parties or things that we call political parties. There are no political parties in Kenya. Classically, there are none. They are things that are registered and are known under the political parties act as political parties. They are not political parties. They are ethnic enclaves controlled by low voltage ethnic warlords. So that if you look at any political party, it will be associated with the Luhia, with the Bukusu, with the Kamba, with the Kikuyu, and, and you cannot run a country like that. And I say this because we are headed for an election in less than 15 months. And I can tell you when the elections will be held in the month of August, in different areas of this republic, there will be people who will be leaving their places of abode in fear of backlash. There will be laws leaving Rift Valley to go to Nyanza until the elections are over. There will be Kikuyus leaving Luoland to come into Central Province because the election, until the elections are over. Students of different ethnic groups in universities which are not, are not in the Aboriginal home will be leaving their universities until the elections are over and we know that there will be no, will, will be no backlash. Those are the levels to which we have descended as a country which lends and gives legitimacy to my subject, unity in diversity, the Kenyan case. Is it a possibility? It is a possibility. And we must work at it. You know, I'm very familiar with Tanzania. Tanzania has 136 Ethnicities, tribes, we call them. 136 plus. Kenya is about 46. If you asked a Tanzanian 
What was the ethnic background of Mwalimu Julius Nyerere? They do not know. I've seen an abstract where somebody is going to talk about Tanzania. They do not know and they do not care. If you ask them what was the ethnic background of Ali Hassan Mwinyi, their second president, they do not know and they do not care. You ask them what was the ethnic background of Benjamin William Kappa, their third president, they do not know and they do not care. You ask them your fourth president, Jakaya Mrisho Kikwete, what was his ethnic background, they do not know and they do not care. You ask them what was the ethnic origin of the late fifth president, John Joseph Pombe Magufuli, they do not know and they do not care. You ask them, what is the ethnic origin of Mama Samia Sulu Hassan, who is the current president? They do not know and they do not care. Come to my Kenya. <laughs> Come to my Kenya. We know that it was Jomo Kenyatta. We knew and we cared. It was Daniel Arab Moy. We knew and we cared. We know it was Kibaki, we, we, know, we knew and we cared. We know it was Uhuru Mwigai Kenyatta and we care. And we are now telling us that the presidency should now be the preserve of some other tribes, not the Kikuyu. Complete nonsense. Complete nonsense. If Kenyans are electing a leader, why should a person be stopped? on the basis of their ethnicity, if he or she has something to offer the country. And yet, you hear people arguing about it, saying that that is what should happen in order to create national cohesion. You know, at one time I said in 1992, now that we have chosen to make absurdity the thing that drives us, why shouldn't we just ask each tribe, each tribe, I said at one time, and I'm, I'm saying this in jest, let us then ask each tribe to select one to be their president. Once they have been selected, then they come to Nairobi and they constitute a presidency. And every two weeks, one of them becomes the chairman of the presidency. So that it becomes that nonsensical. I mean, it is such so nonsensical that when you listen, people say that that is what is going to bring uh, cohesion. President Kenyatta is the president of the Republic of Kenya. He comes from this part of the region. I've driven in one of the worst roads I've ever driven in the last few years. <laughs> Here in Karatina. So it is not a question of where your president comes if you are a professor, it is not because of somebody from your tribe. How can it be that when we are looking for a driver, we, are, we want a good driver? When we are looking for a doctor, we want a good doctor. When we are looking for a lawyer, we want a good lawyer. When we are looking for a professor, we want a good professor. And when we want somebody to run our country, so we Kenyans, and, and this is true even amongst us in the academy, in fact, I dare say that some of the worst culprits are those who have had the advantage of going to school. Because they are the very same who think that when somebody is from their tribe, then they'll be appointed as a minister, or appointed as a cabinet secretary, or something. The men and women on the ground are not bothered. They simply want to survive on a daily basis. So I want to suggest to us that if we truly want to engage in national cohesion, we must change the discourse that we are engaged in. And I, start, I, I was talking about Tanzania. How was that achieved in Tanzania? Leadership. Leadership is at the very heart of it. Mwalimu Julius Kambarage Nyerere made a conscious decision that in order to unite 136 ethnicities, you had to have one language. And they used Kiswahili to good effect. That you had to have a country that is driven by certain ethics and values. And you have to read the Arusha, Azimiola Arusha, the Arusha Declaration, to understand how modern day Tanzania was created. You go to Tanzania today, 
you can be and have talking about things that I know. I have a friend of mine who is from Mwanza. He is a member of parliament in Mtwara. You dare say that in Kenya? <laughs> that somebody who is of Kamba origin to come and seek an elective post in Kiambu, in Kenya? Completely unachievable. And I'm saying that it's not too late in the day. I remember when we were writing our constitution in the year 20, initially 2001, when we were, went around the country and collected the people's views, one of the things that we said when we made the recommendation that you needed to devolve the government to create what are now known as counties, we suggested at that time that we should not have more than 14 counties, at the very best 18. And we suggested that counties should be carved in such a manner that you don't create ethnically pure counties. When the politicians met in Naivasha, they created 47 counties. A, a, a complete joke. We now have 47 governors. The largest number of governors anywhere in the continent of Africa, Nigeria, only has 37. Even the United States of America with, uh, with a population of 300 million only has 50 states, just three more than us. And what did we end up with? We have created ethnic enclaves, and even within the ethnicities, we have created further divisions, so that in the central province region, you now have people calling themselves Nyerians, Kirinyagans, Kiambians, and at that time, you go to Nyanza, there are people from Homa Bay, there are people from Migori, from Siaya, from Kisumu. You go to Kambani, Kitui, and you find people from Machakos, and you find people from Makueni. And all these units that we have brought about have further divided the country into clans. It is no longer the tribe, it is clan. And you go down. I was talking to somebody two weeks ago. He is doing a survey on the state of Kenya's preparedness towards the general election and he did a survey in Bungoma. He said that there are over 30 militias. Some of which are clan based preparing for the elections. So we are not talking about theoretical things here. We are talking about things that threaten the very being of the Kenyan nation. And I'm suggesting that we can still save our country by doing the right things. And what are those right things? You know, when it was suggested recently through an initiative undertaken by President Kenyatta and Mr. Raila Odinga that we amend our constitution under the BBI, they make a suggestion that the following things will create cohesion in our country. That when you create the offices of a president, of a deputy president, prime minister, and two deputy prime ministers, then there will be cohesion. Complete nonsense. And we know it and we don't say it. Because what they are merely suggesting is that the, the creation of officers in and of itself, then you bring cohesion. Sudan has five vice presidents. Is there peace and cohesion? In many parts of Kenya, you have what is called the Central Kenya Block. That is what should be a... That is what should be Machakos, Kitui. Those should be a single country. The entire coast province should be a single county. So that people learn to live together and to appreciate diversity and cultural diversity and a sense of belongingness. Some people say it is too late now. People have gotten so used to these counties. It can be done. Sudan recently reduced their states from 32 to 10. If you want to save a nation, you've got to do things that are bold. And I'm suggesting that one of the ways in which you should do this is to re-examine devolution because devolution, if not taken properly, if not 
structured properly is capable of either making or destroying the country. You know, in the year 2001, Professor Ali Mazurui wrote a paper, if Kenyan politics is ethnic, can we have a constitution that is ethnic proof? That paper was handed over to the Constitution of Kenya Review Commission. And it was one of the things that informed our suggestion that we must not create ethnically pure units. And I'm suggesting that that is one of the things that we should do. Number two, we should sanitize our politics. I've written a book called A Call for Political Hygiene in Kenya. We need hygiene in Kenya. Muhisa Kitui, with whom I agree in what he said, said during an interview that the assumption in Kenya that political bad manners can be solved through constitutional amendments is completely misguided. We have a bunch of some politicians in this country who are completely mannerless. And I am suggesting to you that until the day that that crop of politicians are gone, Kenya will never know peace. What we have now is calm, not peace. The Portuguese call it nom guerra nom paz. No war, no peace. Is it a calm before the storm? Particularly when we are headed to the elections? It could very well be. Because the political class, this is what I say when I'm talking about political hygiene. When you listen to Kenyan politicians, they are preparing and weaponizing their ethnic constituencies. That if we lose the election, the election will have been stolen. I see it happening amongst all the leading political competitors. And one of the ways in which we have now demonstrated in Kenya, one of the ways of getting into government without winning an election is to weaponize your constituency. Once you've weaponized your constituency, then you get into government by threatening the establishment. We must introduce hygiene in our politics. And how do we do so? We must look at the architecture of the political party. As I've said, there are no political parties in Kenya. That is why the mortality rate of political parties is very high. The only thing that appeared to be a party was Kanu, which died. In the last few elections, you can count with me how many political formations we have had. NAC, COD, TNA, Jubilee, ODM Kenya, ODM. You can count them. And if you look at the life history of any typical Kenyan politician, they have, in the last 20 years, they have belonged to no more than, no less than 12 political formations. You talk of the migration of the wildebeest. There is another migration in Kenyan politics. And the net effect of it is that it confuses the electorate and poisons the electoral environment. Is there a political party that I'm thinking about outside of Kenya that I can talk about? Chama Chama Pinduzi in Tanzania once again. 1977, Afro Shirazi joins Tanu and Chama Chama Pinduzi has been there almost since 1961. A political party. A political party. African National Congress in South Africa, 1912. 1912. Frelimo in Mozambique. MPLA in Angola. Swapo in Namibia. Those are political parties. If you ask any one of our politicians today, even the leading ones, if you ask President Kenyatta, how many political parties have you belonged to? <laughs> he has belonged to a number. If you ask Mr. Raila Odinga, how many political parties and formations he has belonged to? Twelve. You ask Mr. Ruto, the same thing. You ask Mr. Musioka, the same thing. Mr. Mudavadi, the same thing. I'm mentioning these things so that you don't use this conference to pretend. 
because we are talking about the life of our nation and national cohesion. And the Kiswahili saying is mtego wapanya uingia waliomo na wasio kuemo. If these individuals don't sanitize our politics, you and me will suffer. You may support them because they come from their tribe, but when vita havina macho, when there is war in Kenya, he doesn't choose a kikuyu guns, he doesn't choose a kamba, he doesn't choose a luo. It kills. Particularly the younger generation, you've got to liberate yourselves from this ethnic morass. If you don't, then there'll be no nation to talk about. So we must, if we want to unite Kenya, sanitize our politics. The third thing that we must do is to look at how our education system works. Education is going to be very important going forward. You know, in Kenya today, it is possible and I've said this at a different forum, it is today possible to have a young individual who went to a school, a primary school in the neighborhood here in Karatina. Then they go to a high school here in Karatina. After they have gone to Karatina, then they come to Karatina University. Then they graduate, then they work in Nyeri County, that individual is a danger to Kenya because his worldview is so narrow, he thinks the whole world is Karatina. No exposure. And it's possible to have somebody in Nyanza to do the same thing, in Machakos to do the same thing. You go to Machakos primary school, you go to Machakos high school, then you go to Machakos university, then you are employed by the county government in Machakos, then you think that everybody is from Machakos. And when you talk about the world, the world means Machakos. In Europe today, and those of you who are academics know, under the Erasmus program in, in Europe, if you are a student from Denmark, you must spend some time out of Denmark. You must do a semester in Spain, in Portugal. And this is what we must do. I'm suggesting that something must be done in our education sector because the generation, our generation is lost. Those of you, somebody is going to talk about cohesion and Joseph in the Bible. I don't know what he's going to talk about. But he is going to talk about something which is biblical. But remember that even if you allow me that biblical analogy, when the Israelites were removed from Egypt, God ensured that none of them go to the promised land. Why? They were out of Egypt, but Egypt was still in them. It is only five people, I think, and the sister there will correct me. It is only five. I think it is Joshua, Gideon, and who? Out of that group that left Egypt that got into the promised land. The rest died in the desert over 40 years. There is a generation here who you should not rely on if you want to make Kenya great. You must discard their habits. You must think differently. You must think Kenyan. You must think East African. You must think African. Only then will you save this country. And that will only come through education and exchanges. You must be somebody in Karatina, but you know what is happening in Migori or in Machakos. You must make a deliberate effort to do this because it is in your selfish interest that Kenya is united. And we can do it. Our cultural diversity is useful. Look at the entrepreneurship of the Kikuyu. If we, if we use it to good effect. Look at the energy of the Luhia people if we use it to good effect. Look at the pursuit of excellence of the Luo people, if we use it to good effect. Look at the humility of the Kamba and the Miji Kenda, if we use it to good effect. Look at the energy of the Maasai, if we use it to good effect. 
Look at the creativity of the Somalis if we used it to good effect. We would have a country that we are proud of. But we emphasize much more the things that divide us than the things that unite us. And the politicians have mastered this art. They divide us and rule us and confuse us and threaten our country. We must no longer allow that. This country can't be united. And it's only you, young men and women, who are going to unite it. So when you come out, I know this is an academic forum, so there'll be papers presented here which are academic, and the academy has its place. But when they say things that don't make practical sense, examine those presentations. If they are sugar-coated, remove the sugar and consume the thing raw. It is only then that we can save this country. And I'm suggesting that it can be done and it will be done. But we must work at it because history has demonstrated times without number that the things that require effort can only be achieved through effort. And if you have an opportunity to speak, speak without fear. Because it is only by saying these things as they are that we are going to open the eyes of these individuals who are in positions of political power. I do not know what Dr. Kobia told you yesterday, but he must have told you, among other things, that their body is going to create cohesion and integration. Not true. That is not the role of their body. Even if they wanted, they cannot do it. It is us. So when I hear people saying the National and Integration Commission is not doing this, what can they do? There are only nine commissioners and possibly 200 people. Even if they wanted to do it, what would they do? It is you and us. So each one of us who is present in this assembly, my message to you is go out there this evening and engage in an exercise of soul searching. If you have ghosts of kikuyuness, of the negative kind residing in your heart and mind, exercise them. If you have luo ghosts dancing in your heart and mind, telling you that the kambas are not good, exercise those ghosts. If you have kamba ghosts, of the negative kind dancing in your mind and heart, remove them from your heart. Celebrate your kikuyuness, your kambaness, and everything else, but celebrate them because diversity is divine. But that what we should do, what we should recognize, and it is Martin Luther King Jr. who said it, the mind is ultimately the standard of the man, and Robert Sobuku in South Africa when he was fighting against the apartheid, he told there is only one race, the human race. And within that race, God in his love for diversity has created people who speak different tongues. We should be celebrated and we should not be the basis of dividing us. So ladies and gentlemen, mine was to render my thoughts, not as an academic presenter, but simply to provoke critical issues as you go through these three days of looking at our country and looking at unity and examining the things that undermine our unity. I've brought to the fore some of the things that I think stand in the way of our unity and I've suggested that it is possible to unite this country and that it is critical that we must make sure that the political class who have been in the forefront of dividing this country are brought to the fore and they are made aware that we can no longer afford the luxury of being confused. And those of us in the academy who have also been enticed by their woos and cajolment, it is our duty to educate younger people. And you young people, as I've said, it is your duty to ensure that you protect this country so that in 100 years from today, those who will be there will be able to say, 
we have a Kenya which is unique in her diversity, united in her diversity. Thank you very much and God bless you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Pierre Orumumba. Um, uh, for that uh, wonderful and uh, exciting, stimulating uh, presentation, uh, I look at you that you never repeated yourself. I thought you would have a notebook like mine. <laughs> I didn't see any. <laughs> and the presentation was very organized. You are able to bring out our little selves. What we are refusing to accept about ourselves, you have brought it out. And we can see it, and we should accept it. You have uh, compared us with the uh, uh, with the nations like uh, Tanzania, ah, yes, uh, where they are more con cohesive than us and they have more tribes than we have. And he did this a challenge for all of us to take. Uh, you uh, have also gave, given proposals on how to, 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 to deal with this, uh, uh, this challenge of uh, promoting cohesion and integration. And that's a good challenge, challenge for us. You have been indeed very candid. We appreciate uh, you for that. Can we give him an applause? <laughs> and better one. <laughs> Thank you very much. We'll take a few questions. And uh, we'll, take, we'll first take three questions. But there are questions on the chat. And we would like to uh, read those on the chat first. Uh, after those ones, then we will take some other, how many questions in the chat? Uh, two. Then we can take some other two, and then, uh, uh, Prof, you can respond to those first. And when you come to answer them, you could sit in front. Thank you. Uh, the first question on the chat is from Asigem Maitsi. He's asking uh, the professor to expound on why national cohesion and integration strategies are failing in the Kenyan context. Why are national cohesion and integration strategies failing in the Kenyan context? Uh, secondly, what role can civil societies play on the same subject. Thank you. Yes, uh, we can take some other two questions. Just a minute, sorry, just a minute. There's another question also online from Jared Motanya. He's asking how then can we create a culture of political, satiable environment with the goal of having a unified Kenya? Uh, thank you. Thank you for those three questions. And uh, thank you for those of you who are online and have uh, posted your questions on the chat. I believe we will continue doing that even after this. Yeah, some other two questions, please. Where is the hand? Uh, yes, the gentleman in the, yeah, that one. Uh, my good, good morning. Morning. My question is, uh, I agree with the prof that in Kenya, political socialization is an issue. But I can see, uh, I can remember President Daniel Moy once said that can we lead 100 years? Currently, you can see uh, President Kenyatta, Raira Odinga, and uh, Deputy President William Ruto, they are all disciples of Kanu. How is this, how is it now going to be? Because even 2022, uh, we can even perceive and presume that maybe the leader who will be will come from Kanu, but with a different vehicle to presidency. Thank you. Uh, this side, is there a question? Uh, okay, one question at the back, then Prof. Samwarubye, and uh, we uh, will ask Prof. to answer those, those ones first. 
Thank you so much. My one question to Prof. He has pointed out that uh, the lenders we have are actually misleading us and not leading us to realize cohesion. Now, my question is, who then is to lend us and who should the citizens follow to realize cohesion? Thank you. Thank you. Professor Mwarubi, the last question. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Professor Mwarovia. Thank you for um, Professor Piero Rumumba for that stimulating um, uh, presentation and actually a challenge to all of us. Um, I want to ask uh, issues to do with national cohesion and integration and in relation also to our legal framework that we use in this country. In most cases, we have seen people who promote hate speech, as it is called. They are taken to court, and of course those with hate speeches are also very rich, or they have the resources, they end up enlisting the services of the best legal minds to represent them. And therefore, the hate end up being sanitized and it becomes innocent. Is it that we have not been able to utilize adequately the existing laws that we have in this country to solve the challenges that are opposed by this topic that we are discussing. That is one. Two, is the last one, very brief. It has been suggested that if we can we hope to correct the wrongs that we have, either of corruption, of lack of this, we should have benevolent dictator who will be able to help us to come up with a more cohesive society. I think those two, I wouldn't mind you responding to. responding to the good professor about the legal framework. You will remember in 1971, the former leader of Chile, Salvador Allende, who was overthrown by Augusto Pinochet. And this is what he said, that the problem with Chile is the assumption that laws in and of themselves will solve our problems. And this was the clincher. That in Chile there are, there are all the laws that we need except one law. The law that says we follow the other laws. And he was speaking tongue in cheek by saying that you've got to have a culture If you look at laws, and um, allow me this latitude, if you go to Nairobi, you find people with mikokoteni. You know, there are city council bylaws that say that animal-drawn and hand-drawn cut should never be in the central business district. We have laws, but we don't follow. We have border border now, which are passenger carrying. They have no insurance. Yet we know that you and you drive a car, you must have a third part insurance. There is a law that does not allow, this. it's not allowed for them to hurry, carry more than one passenger. They carry even five 
and the policeman is there looking. You go to Rwanda, all of them have helmets. Every passenger has a helmet. In other words, I'm saying a legal framework is a good thing. But the country must have a culture of obeying laws. We don't have such a culture in this country. And in this country, it would appear when you, are, when you have money and good social connections, you can get away almost with anything, at best a slap in the wrist. Recently, the governor of Mombasa was found to have been in contempt of court and fined 250,000 shillings. A joke. Pocket change. I'm sure he could even have sent one of his workers to pay 250. You go to other countries. When that happens, you are punished so visibly that the rest will see that this is what will happen to me. We don't have that culture. And that is why, therefore, when you talk about national cohesion, and we have seen many individuals saying terrible things about different ethnicities. I talked at the very beginning about listening to people at funerals. I'm sure you attend some of them. You listen to some of the things that the politicians say in their mother tongue about other ethnicities. It is terrible. It is terrible. And nothing happens. So until the day that we'll have that culture, and that culture can be brought about by leadership. I remember when President Kibaki was elected as the president of the Republic of Kenya, people were so angry with corruption that they would arrest policemen. Then it disappeared. There was a time when John Jiroge Mishuki said that everybody should wear seat belts in Matatus. Do you wear seat belts in Matatus? A culture cannot be created by the episodic action of an individual. It must be a culture which is strengthened by those individuals. If you think that there will be a figure in the nature of Moses to be parting Red Seas, nonsense. It will not happen. We must have a culture of doing the right thing. And that is what we don't have in this country. That is what, if you talked about benevolent dictators, you go to Rwanda now. If you talk to, if you told a taxi driver in Rwanda, are there Hutus and Tutsis, he will stop. There is no such talk. We are Rwandese. Of course, the genocide informs that. You see, the streets are clean. The leadership has brought in a culture of performance. My prayer is that it will be sustained beyond that generation of leaders. Because sustenance is the most important thing. Culture. You know, those of you who are in academic leadership here, and I read the core values of, of the universe, this nation great. In Kenya, oh, they have been given money. Nyerere used to say, and I'll say it in Kiswahili because it was beautifully said, Mtu akiwa amefilisika na anasera atauza vitu viwili. Dini na kabila. Kama anasera, when somebody has no policy position, he sells two things, religion and tribe. And that is the problem. And that is why you get the leaders that you deserve. If you vote on the basis of people's ethnic extraction, then you get such leaders. And that is what Kenyans do on a daily basis. Every election cycle. So the quality of followership is also a problem, not only in Kenya, in very many African countries. Remember, when I started, I took you around Africa.
and saw the conflicts that are taking place. Why? Not that conflict is the preserve of Africa, but that was the state of Africa because the African voter does not use the right criteria to vote individuals. Even in universities now, I'm told that even at universities here in Karatina, maybe here not in Karatina, but you have an association called Kirinyaga Students Association. Luo Students Association. Why? Why? Why should you have such in an academic institution? I want to hear Engineering Student Association. Agriculture Student Association. Commerce Student Association. Not Luo, not Kamba, not Embu. Those ones you can form out there. This is an academic institution. When you go to the University of Dar es Salaam, Sokoina University, you will never, never, ever hear Sukuma Students Association. You will never hear Nyamwezi Students Association or higher students of association, law students association. Because it starts here and confirm to me that you don't have such associations in Karatina University. And if you have them, I know they have them at Kimoi University, at the uh, University of Nairobi, Kenyatta University. Because even at university, student leaders also now pay money and are voted on the basis of ethnicity. So followership. So whom shall you follow? Follow men and women who will speak the truth as it is. Nyerere used to say at one time, and he was a great man, ukiona mtu anataka sana kwenda ikulu mkwepe kama ukoma. Kone ukulu inabiyashara gani mkwaisa? Kuna biyashara gani ikulu mtu anataka kuwa na kuwa watu kwa sababu ya kuenda ikulu? The great leaders are reluctant leaders. Many of you here are Christians. Look at the leaders whom God chose. They were reluctant. Moses says, send somebody else I cannot speak. That is whom God chooses. But unfortunately, we as a people are incapable of seeing such. I one time tried to be a member of parliament just to tell you how the electorate behaves. I formed my own political party in this country. I misguided myself that you can form a political party on the basis of ideals. Chama Chauzalendo was the name of the party. And I offered myself for election at Kamukunji. I held 250 town hall meetings. I had 1,500, 1 1.5 million shillings donated by my two friends. I spent only 500 and returned the rest. The person who won the election never campaigned on a single day. He had imported voters from all over. I spoke, spoke about had something called Sauti Akamukunji said the things that I would want to do. And one person during a conference told, said something that was defining. He said, Sisi atutaki sera tunataka pesa. Kanu. You talked about and have answered the question about political leadership. I do not care about political. What I want are men and women who love this country. And there is no shortage of them. Today, unfortunately, many good men and women can't get into politics because politics requires too much money. And they don't have thugs who are going to support their enterprise. So, for the next 10 years, you are going to get the leaders that you deserve. Civil society. Unfortunately, the civil society in this country has become weaker and weaker. In the 1990s, the civil society was quite strong. And partly the problem with the civil society as it was then defined. Civil society must be understood in its broad sense. But as it is understood in Kenya in its very narrow sense, it depended too much on donor funding, and when the donor funding dried up, then that also ensured that the beneficiaries died or became, in, became comatose. 
The other thing that happened with the civil society in this country is that they have also become ethnic. They have also been captured by the political class and therefore their impact is reduced. The last question is strategies for national cohesion. You know, one of the things that I've discovered is that most things actually fall or rise on leadership. If you have leaders who do what they say, leaders who are fearless in every sphere, the country can change in a week. And I've seen that happen in Africa. I saw it here during Kibaki's first term. The mere assumption that that administration wanted to do things differently energized the population. It is only when the administration relaxed that things changed. I saw that in Tanzania with President John Joseph Pombe Magufuli. I'm seeing that in Tanzania with Mama Samia Suluhu Hassan. You know, I'm imagining to myself if what happened in Tanzania would have happened in Kenya, God forbid. How would we have handled it? We would first have said you can't have a president who is a Muslim and a prime minister who is a Muslim because Salim Majaliwa Majaliwa is a Muslim. You will say you can't have a president who is from Zanzibar and the president of Zanzibar is also from Zanzibar. I say Kikuyus must have it, Luos must have it, Kalenjin must have it, and people would have been throwing stones here and there, God forbid. Strategies for national integration is having institutions that are designed to work. My good friend, Dr. Kobia, whom I respect and who has worked internationally in dispute resolution, must have told you how frustrated he is on a daily basis. You are given an organization, but no funding. You are given something that requires a spade, and they give you a tablespoon. You ask, ask for a budget for 100 million shillings, you are given 5 million shillings. You can't achieve. If we believe in doing things, you've got to have strategies that are meant to work and they must be resourced. Number two, you've got to integrate and ensure that all sectors of the, of, of the country are involved. Look at the religious sector. That's why I said I'd never blame cohesion and integration. I'm, all of us must be involved. You can't have a single body charged. It is merely presiding. Where, where is the religious sector? I want to see them active in that regard. I want to see the Muslim ulamas. I want to see the Christians. I want to see the other African traditional religions. Everybody must be involved in this enterprise. And we must be consistent in the things that we say. So at a strategic level, a good legal framework is good. Having institutions involved in a strategic way, strategic way to mean that they address the critical areas that that is education is going to be important. Ensuring that schools are involved and students are involved at a very early level. Ensuring that you do things that are designed to emphasize unity rather than emphasize disunity. And all those things are things that we know. Nigeria, as I conclude, and Kenya are very interesting. Nigeria has something called the federal character. When you are employing people, you've got to look at the federal character. We call it the, the, the face of the nation in Kenya. And yet they are the ones that are doing very badly in this regard. Why? Because we don't implement what we have in legislation. Implementation is the only thing that will ensure that the things that we want to do are actually achieved. And I'm suggesting that after this conference, for example, 
it is important that the findings of this conference are circulated to all members of parliament are circulated to all governors and that you have an opportunity to present this to the president of the republic and all political parties it is only then that these things will become valuable otherwise these conferences will only have an academic value without more yet we need action on the ground thank you very much i hope i've shared my thoughts with you on the issues you've raised thank you very much uh, let's give uh, professor kumumba a better hand clap Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. We don't have ones to say uh, thank you. Uh, we appreciate you, uh, Prof. And we would wish that you are with us. We would wish that you regularly come and talk to us, uh, including our students. Uh, you are answering of the questions and a lot of wisdom. Uh, we have learned a lot from you. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Can we give him another hand of applause? Uh, yes, uh, from this point, we would want to take a break to go for tea. But before we go for tea, uh, there are two groups waiting for us there. I think we can give one of them uh, a few minutes, uh, three minutes uh, to perform. Then uh, uh, afterwards we will see where to slot the others. Uh, or we could give two of them three minutes each and then uh, eight minutes and then we go for tea uh, because they are also contributing to us uh, our objectives of this conference it's about culture it's about cohesion it's about integr integration uh, so with that i want to invite the group which is ready dr gishohi which group is ready teto Gatito, okay. Yeah, Gatito group, please come. Uh, you have only three minutes uh, to perform, and we appreciate you. Karibu. Then Gatito group will be followed by the, the Machakos group. Machakos group should be ready. The other group will perform uh, later on, maybe just before lunch or after lunch. Uh, thank you very much. Welcome.
Asante sana. Thank you very much. You can give them an applause. Thank you very much, Gatito Choir, Gatito Group, Cultural Group. Now we invite the Machakos Cultural Group. Uh, the floor is yours. Are you there? What we are Machakos, Mukonanda Kaine, Mukuje. Come and perform.
Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. That was a very wonderful performance uh, from um, the Machakos team. Even the Gatito team did uh, very well. We appreciate our cultural teams. And we appreciate our cultural diversity. I think we are running some of us who are not uh, from that region, but we are very close to that region. We are running a lot. And we are becoming Kenyans. Uh, I want now to give you a, a tea break. You are scheduled to have that minutes break. We are going to agree. I'm only giving you 15 minutes. If it is not enough, kindly advise me not to give you any break for tea. All right. That is an indication that the break uh, is, uh, is enough. So right now it's uh, uh, 11.21. We resume at 11.36. At 11.36, uh, the director from Amaya Triangle will make the presentation. Uh, we will give you 10 minutes for presentation, and then we will reserve a few minutes for question. And that goes to every other presenter so that we can be able to manage our time. Kindly understand, organize your presentation. During the tea break uh, DVC, you can talk with the PRO and... Uh, I think we can reach an understanding where he can also come and start a school of law. He has to be the founder dean. Thank you.